Студия Ардис представляет аудиокниги. Лучшие произведения мировой литературы. Подробную информацию об аудиокнигах студии Ардис смотрите в интернете на сайте www.ardisbook.ru Lobo, the King of Kurumpaw by Ernest Seton Thompson Kurumpaw is a vast cattle range in northern New Mexico. It is a land of rich pastures and teeming flocks and herds, a land of rolling mesas and precious running waters that at length unite in the Kurumpaw River, from which the whole region is named. And the king, whose despotic power was felt over its entire extent, was an old gray wolf. Old Lobo, or the king, as the Mexicans called him, was the gigantic leader of a remarkable pack of gray wolves that had ravaged the Kurumpaw Valley for a number of years. All the shepherds and ranchmen knew him well, and wherever he appeared with his trusty band, terror reigned supreme among the cattle, and wrath and despair among the owners. Old Lobo was a giant among wolves and was cunning and strong in proportion to his size. His voice at night was well known and easily distinguished from that of any of his fellows. An ordinary wolf might howl half the night about the herdsman's bivouac without attracting more than a passing notice. But when the deep roar of the old king came booming down the cannon, the watcher bestirred himself and prepared to learn in the morning that fresh and serious inroads had been made among the herds. Old Lobo's band was but a small one. This I never quite understood, for usually, when a wolf rises to the position of power that he had, he attracts a numerous following. It may be that he had as many as he desired, or perhaps his ferocious temper prevented the increase of his pack. Certain it is that Lobo had only five followers during the latter part of his reign. Each of these, however, was a wolf of renown. Most of them were above the ordinary size. One in particular, the second in command, was a veritable giant. But even he was far below the leader in size and prowess. Several of the band, besides the two leaders, were especially noted. One of those was a beautiful white wolf, which the Mexicans called Blanca, which was supposed to be a female, possibly Lobo's mate. Another was a yellow wolf of remarkable swiftness, which, according to current stories, had on several occasions captured an antelope for the pack. It will be seen, then, that these wolves were thoroughly well known by the cowboys and shepherds. They were frequently seen and often heard and their lives were intimately associated with those of the cattlemen, who would so gladly have destroyed them. There was not a stockman on the Kurumpaw who would not readily have given the value of many steers for the scalp of any one of Lobo's band, but they seemed to possess charmed lives and defied all manner of devices to kill them. They scorned all hunters, derided all poisons, and continued, for at least five years, to exact their tribute from the Kurumpaw ranchers to the extent, many said, of a cow each day. According to this estimate, therefore, the band had killed more than 2,000 of the finest stock, for, as was only too well known, they selected the best in every instance. The old idea that a wolf was constantly in a starving state, and therefore ready to eat anything, was as far as possible from the truth in this case. For these freebooters were always sleek and well-conditioned and were, in fact, most fastidious about what they ate. Any animal that had died from natural causes or that was diseased or tainted, they would not touch. They even rejected anything that had been killed by the stockmen. 
Their choice in daily food was the tenderer part of a freshly killed yearling heifer, an old bull or cow they disdained. And though they occasionally took a young calf or colt, it was quite clear that veal or horse flesh was not their favorite diet. It was also known that they were not fond of mutton, although they often amused themselves by killing sheep. One night in November, 1893, Blanca and the yellow wolf killed 250 sheep, apparently for the fun of it, and did not eat an ounce of their flesh. These are the examples of many stories which I might repeat to show the ravages of this destructive band. Many new devices for their extinction were tried each year, but still they lived and throve in spite of all the efforts of their foes. A great price was set on Lobo's head, and in consequence poison in a score of subtle forms was put out for him, but he never failed to detect and avoid it. One thing only he feared, that was the firearms, and knowing full well that all men in this region carried them, he never was known to attack or face a human being. Indeed, the set policy of his band was to take refuge in flight whenever, in the daytime, a man was descried, no matter at what distance. Lobo's habit of permitting the pack to eat only that which they themselves had killed was in numerous cases their salvation. And the keenness of his scent to detect the taint of human hands or the poison itself completed their immunity. On one occasion, one of the cowboys heard the too familiar rallying cry of Old Lobo, and stealthily approaching, he found the Kurumpaw pack in a hollow, where they had round up a small herd of cattle. Lobo set apart on a knoll, while Blanca with the rest was endeavoring to cut out a young cow which they had selected but the cattle were standing in a compact mass with their heads outward and presented to the foe a line of horns, unbroken save when some cow, frightened by a fresh onset of the wolves, tried to retreat into the middle of the herd. It was only by taking advantage of these breaks that the wolves had succeeded at all in wounding the selected cow, but she was far from being disabled and it seemed that Lobo at length lost patience with his followers, for he left his position on the hill and, uttering a deep roar, dashed toward the herd. The terrified rank broke at his charge, and he sprang in among them. Then the cattle scattered like the pieces of a bursting bomb. Away went the chosen victim, but ere she had gone twenty-five yards, Lobo was upon her. Seizing her by the neck, He suddenly held back with all his force and so threw her heavily to the ground. The shock must have been tremendous, for the heifer was thrown hills overhead. Lobo also turned a somersault, but immediately recovered himself, and his followers, falling on the poor cow, killed her in a few seconds. Lobo took no part in the killing. After having thrown the victim, he seemed to say, Now, why could not some of you have done that at once without wasting so much time? The men now rode up shouting. The wolves, as usual, retired, and he, having a bottle of strychnine, quickly poisoned the carcass in three places, then went away, knowing they would return to feed, as they had killed the animal themselves. But next morning, when going to look for his expected victims, he found that, although the wolves had eaten the heifer, They had carefully cut out and thrown aside all the parts that had been poisoned. The dread of this great wolf spread yearly among the ranchmen, and each year a larger price was set on his head until at last it reached a thousand dollars, an unparalleled wolf bounty, surely. Many a good man had been hunted down for less. Tempted by the promised reward, a Texan ranger named Tannery came one day galloping up the cannon of the Kurumpaw. He had a superb outfit for wolf hunting, the best of guns and horses, and a pack of enormous wolfhounds. Far out on the plains of the Panhandle, he and his dogs had killed many a wolf, and now he never doubted that within a few days old Lobo's scalp would dangle at his saddle bow. Away they went, 
bravely on their hunt in the gray dawn of a summer morning, and soon the great dogs gave joyous tongue to say that they were already on the track of their quarry. Within two miles, the grisly band of Kurumpaw leaped into view, and the chase grew fast and furious. The part of the wolfhounds was merely to hold the wolves at bay till the hunter could ride up and shoot them, and this usually was easy on the open plains of Texas. But here, a new feature of the country came into play and showed how well Lobo had chosen his range, for the rocky cannons of the Kurumpaw and its tributaries intersected the prairies in every direction. The old wolf at once made for the nearest of these and by crossing it got rid of the horsemen. His band then scattered and thereby scattered the dogs. And when they reunited at a distant point, of course all the dogs did not turn up. And the wolves, no longer outnumbered, turned on their pursuers and killed or desperately wounded them. That night, when Tannery mustered his dogs, only six of them returned, and of these, two were terribly lacerated. This hunter made two other attempts to capture the royal scalp, but neither of them was more successful than the first, and on the last occasion his best horse met its death by a fall. So he gave up the chase in disgust and went back to Texas, leaving Lobo more than ever the despot of the region. Next year, two other hunters appeared, determined to win the promised bounty. Each believed he could destroy this noted wolf, the first by means of a newly devised poison, which was to be laid out in an entirely new manner, the other, a French-Canadian, by poison assisted with certain spells and charms, for he firmly believed that Lobo was a veritable loop garou and would not be killed by ordinary means. But cunningly compounded poisons, charms, and incantations were of no avail against this grisly devastator. He made his weekly rounds and daily banquets as aforetime, and before many weeks had passed, Cologne and Laloche gave up in despair and went elsewhere to hunt. In the spring of 1893, after his unsuccessful attempt to capture Lobo, Joe Cologne had a humiliating experience which seems to show that the big wolf simply scorned his enemies and had absolute confidence in himself. Cologne's farm was on a small tributary of the Kurumpaw in a picturesque cannon, and among the rocks of this very cannon within a thousand yards of the house, old Lobo and his mate selected their den and raised their family that season. There they lived all summer and killed Joe's cattle, sheep, and dogs, but laughed at all his poison and traps, and rested securely among the recesses of the cavernous cliffs, while Joe vainly racked his brain for some method of smoking them out, or of reaching them with dynamite. But they escaped entirely unscathed, and continued their ravages as before. There's where he lived all last summer, said Joe, pointing to the face of the cliff, and I couldn't do a thing with him. I was like a fool to him.